listening to another episode of the Business of Aesthetics podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsor, AMP. AMP innovates your aesthetic practice. We also want to thank our silver sponsors, Eilis Works and Pronox. Today we are going to be speaking with one of the finest experts in aesthetics. Our host's passion led Naren Aruraja, a serial entrepreneur with 16 years of experience in aesthetic marketing, to co-found the Business of Aesthetics community. Over to you, Naren. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Business of Aesthetics podcast show. This is Naren, your co-founder and co-host of the Business of Aesthetics podcast show. Today, I'm excited to be having a conversation with a renowned uh, doctor, a plastic surgeon uh, by the name of Brian Pinsky. And uh, before we jump in, I'm sure many of you have heard of him or you know visited his website or seen, his, uh, seen him on social media. But before we jump in, I just wanted to welcome Dr. Brian Pinsky and have him kind of tell us who he is. So in case you haven't heard of him or seen him around, you know, so you get an overview of who, who we are learning from today. Uh, hi, uh, again, my name is Brian Pinsky. Uh, originally, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and I, um, I went to university, college at the University of Pennsylvania and medical school at Case Western Reserve University and ultimately did a residency in plastic and reconstructive surgery at Mount Sinai in, in Manhattan. And a, I did a year of fellowship of, uh, within hand surgery at UCLA. And then now I'm in practice in Long Island at the Long Island Plastic Surgical Group which is uh, one of the largest uh, single specialty private practice plastic surgical group in the country. Um, I'm one of uh, 22 additional surgeons and I practice solely on Long Island uh, outside of New York City. Yeah, today's conversation is all about how do you thrive in a, in a group practice? And uh, more and more group practices are becoming uh, the norm. And the reason is, it's getting harder and harder for one person doctors to thrive um, in a increasingly complex, increasingly competitive world. Now, at least the perception is in a group practice, you become a piece of the machine and you don't really have autonomy to do the things you like or do the things you enjoy. So that's one of the downsides I hear. So you're going to have a wonderful conversations about the benefits, the challenges, and, and what do you need to do to thrive in a situation like the one that Dr. Brian Pinsky is in. So hopefully anybody else who's either considering or in, in group situations, uh, perhaps can benefit. And also even people in private practices, one or two doctor practices can still, I'm sure, get a lot of ideas from our conversation today. So Dr. Brian, um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Let's start. Tell us, when did you join this group and, and what made you join this group? Well, I mean, I joined the group in 2012. My, I mean, my wife is from this area geographically, so it was important to her from a family point of view to be in this area. And so when I was looking around for jobs, I happened to have uh, some friends, actually, some people that I trained with that had that were part of the practice already, and obviously I knew the reputation of the group and and the history, and so that made it appealing. And I interviewed, and they offered me a position, and you know, here I am, many <laughs> seemingly many years later. Um, and uh, so, you know, so I think you know, I think people choose where they want to practice. We have residents, and I have these discussions with them all the time. You know, the people choose where they want to practice for a lot of different reasons, but I think. A majority of them tend to be, you know, family driven, which was in my case. Right. Now let's just jump in uh, before we talk about what you need to do to thrive in an environment like this. Let's talk about some of the benefits, um, some of the challenges. Let's start with the benefits. Uh, I mean, I think the benefit is that you know, obviously, administratively, you know, the you know, you're not, I'm not personally responsible for the entirely of the administration of the practice. So, I mean, there, you know, I have certain responsibilities that are to the group as a whole, but I mean, you know, there are, you know, we have people that are responsible for that. You know, we have practice managers and a separate billing and collections departments and a marketing department and things that, that really are handled the business aspect of the practice. I mean, obviously the physicians are in charge and there's a, 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 um, a management structure within the physician group. Um, that's a vote that are voted and elected. But so what you're saying is you can uh, leave the work at work and go home and not have to think about it because correct. there you're are right. other people who are looking at other things that you don't need to worry about. Right, exactly. And, and I mean, because in a solo private practice situation, you know, you're entirely responsible for everything from soup to nuts, from the 
you know, from paying the rent to ordering the supplies to, you know, to the policies and procedures of the office. And, you know, what do you, what do you do if a patient doesn't show up three times and do what kind of a policy do you have written for that? And, you know, and, you well, know, COVID happens and what do you do with your employees and how do you correct. get all the money from the government? All that you have to figure out. You have to figure out all that, which is quite a bit of quite a lot. You know, I think, and for me, I was not as interested in that aspect of practicing, at least, you know, coming straight out of my fellowship. And you know, I really wanted to, to focus on the medicine, on the, on the medicine, the surgery, and less so on the business aspect of it. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't, it didn't hold an interest as much. And also, you know, I didn't have the experience uh, within it. You know, and, and, you know, maybe I sort of, you know, if I had to go back and do all over again, I may have, uh, you know, pursued a little more expertise or experience in that in that realm, you know, but uh, it's hard, it's hard to turn back the clock 10 years. Um, but uh, so, so that's you know, what made what made this type of a practice environment appealing. And, you know, and I did think that if you're looking at a group private practice versus an academic practice, that there's, you know, a little more flexibility in terms of what you do in a, in a, in a private situation than, than in academics. Um, so that I also found that to be uh, appealing as well. Right. Uh, now let's talk about some of the challenges. Um, I know what the myth or what the stories are, but what 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 are the challenges? Um, well, I mean, I think that you know, with any group situation, and I think this applies to private and academic as well. You know, your you know, the personalities of the people involved play a big role in the culture of the organization. So you know, so you know. I think the, the more people there are in a group, it probably dilutes that a little bit. So it's so it's less, you know, one person's personality or difficulties kind of are, are diluted a bit when there are more people involved. But if it's just you and one other guy, if the other guy happens to be difficult or opinionated or whatever, you know, you, that really can impact your, you know, or unscrupulous or anything like that. It can, it can impact your life uh, substantially. Um, you know, but uh, so I think so, some of the challenges are just, you know, how do you fit into to the dynamic of, you know, the group dynamic, because in, in your own office, you can do whatever you want, you know, you can make any policy you want, set, set the hours, whatever you want, and, you know, make it tailored completely to your own lifestyle and your own needs. And that's not necessarily possible in a group situation, you have to be flexible, you know, you have to be willing to compromise on certain things. And that, I mean, that's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, life is full of compromises, but it's, um, right. you know, but I think that's something that's, you know, you have to, and, and then you have to also know, you know, what, what, you know, when to say yes and when to say no. I mean, there are times when, you know, you have to stand up for yourself and say that, you know, this doesn't work for me. And, you know, I, I think that I, you know, but you do that when it's important, you know, you can't, you can't do that for everything. Every, everything, right. You can't right. just, you can't call wolf every time. Then. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you can't cry wolf all the time. So you have to, you yeah. have to save those moments for when they matter. And then you tend to be treated well, you know, and I feel like I'm treated very well. So I have no complaints. Absolutely. And again, I'm just uh, just asking an off the wall question. Let's say if I'm a D personality type, like, you know, dominant, right? right. You think a group would be more challenging for somebody like that? Like yeah. you look like you are somebody who gets along with people just talking to you for two minutes. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I, I think it can be. I mean, I think, you know, I think that, again, you have to be flexible because, you know, if you're not the founding member of the organization, and you're walking into an existing situation with an existing culture and existing, you know, way they do things, you know, you can't come in and start beating a drum and try to totally reinvent the wheel. I mean, what I, what I have found is you can, you can make things how you want it in your own microcosm, as long as they're not, you know, encroaching upon other people, you know, you know, I can, you know, if I, I have my own, you know, administrative assistant that works with me and, and billers and collectors and, and a nurse that works with me pretty much full time. And so, you know, I'm allowed, I can, you know, structure those areas to best suit my, my personality and practice style, but it's, you know, it's hard to, you know, some of the other stuff you just have to say, okay, that's good. You know, it's okay. It is what it is, you know? Right. Now let's switch gears. We talked about uh, the, the benefits and we talked about the challenges. Now let's talk about, okay, you are in this situation or you choose to be in this situation. How do you make the most of it? Right. And um, I'm going to take it in buckets. So instead of trying to, you know, talk about everything at once, let's break it into pieces. So let's start with, um, you know, the big picture. Like, you know, we all as human beings, uh, of course, want to be successful. Typically, that's measured in terms of uh, degrees, money, things like that. We all want to do the th kind of things that, 
we enjoy, right? We all like certain things, don't like certain things. We all, to some degree, you know, want to practice the way we want to practice. Um, now, you you clearly pointed out, this is not your own practice. You're part of a group with 22 other doctors. So you, there are certain battles you can fight and certain battles you don't want to fight, right? So uh, the way I see it, at least talking to you, is, is that it's almost like... Um, a business within a business it's almost like uh you know uh, a practice within a practice so t- let's talk about the big picture how do you think about it i mean now that you have been here for a while and you have learned the lessons and you know you know what not to do and what to do like how do you see it like, like what's your mindset well i mean i think you know i really think that it's it's an evolving process you know i feel like when you know the way i view my practice and myself you know when i started is not at all you know how I view things now. You know, and talk so about that. that. Talk about how you viewed it on day one with no knowledge, no experience <laughs> well, versus today. I mean, I, I think I I came in it with a pretty open mind and a pretty blank slate. Meaning, like for the first year, I just did anything that walked in the door. You know, I figured I will take, I will do anything anyone asks me to do. I'll do anything that walks in the door. I'll go anywhere, anything, and without saying boo about it. You know, and I did that for a good year. And it was hard, you know, it was difficult. It was, you know, running around like crazy. And, and, I, and I did a lot of work and it was not, and it was good work. You know, I, I was, I mean, and it was helpful because at the time you're trying to pass my boards and do all these other things that are important to do. Um, but, you know, it was like a whirlwind, you know, and, you know, and then you have to couple with that your own personal life, you know, and my wife was pregnant and like all these kind of things. So it's like, you know, everything is just like a big, you know, complete, utter jumble. So survival mode, just do whatever right, it takes exactly. to get through another day. Yeah, that's right. And then, the, so, you know, and then don't overthink it. Oh, is it good, bad? No, just do it. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. And that's, and I think that's, a, I mean, I think that was a good way to start. Yes. But then I think you also start to understand the landscape of where you're practicing. So, because every practice, every area has its own personality, even within like, you know, every hospital has its own personality or every, you know, surgery center or whatever. So you get to see, you know, where do you feel comfortable? Where don't you feel comfortable? You know, do you like the, do you like, they, they treat you nicely here, not so nicely here, you know, you know, so are they favorable? Are they accommodating to your needs and this and that? And so you kind of just get a sense of where you like to be within any, within a small area. And then I also realized that, you know, you know, in the beginning, you, you spend a lot of time doing overflow from other people, at least in a, in a, tending so in a larger environment you know there's enough excess work from other people to be done that that you do that you know and that's what and of course i think that's common of everybody but then you kind of realize at least i realized that that wasn't really a sustaining way to go you know you can't spend your whole career just doing other people's work you have to create your own work you know and and that i think is a slow process and so that so then you know about my second third year is that i really started leaning into that and in trying to make my own referrals, carve out my own niche and my own place. And, you know, I was definitely less busy at those times than I was in the beginning, you know, because, you know, it's, but I was sort of trying to capture it for myself. And I think, you know, and that meant, you know, meeting new referral, referring positions, you know, it was a lot of, you know, community, like literally hitting the pavement. Like I made, I made, I would literally go through the phone, the, do a Google search or, you know, anything for, you know, a t- say a five mile radius from my office. And then I look for, you know, what insurance plans do I take? And I look for every primary care physician that's in that insurance network within five miles of my office. And I would reach out and I'd contact them and I'd set up lunches or, you know, send coffee to their office and, you know, knock on the door, sit down with them for, you know, 15, 20 minutes at their lunchtime. And, and I did that a lot for a couple of years and it was largely good, you know, largely it, I definitely met some people that sent, ended up sending me tons and still do send me tons of patients just because of one meeting, you know, for 15 minutes. And I, and I realized that a lot of people refer patients out to other people because not, not because they know them or know anything about them. It's just because they need somewhere to go. They need patients, their patients need somewhere to go. It's a name, it's a name. You know, they don't even really have much of a contact with their office ever. They just say, here, you go see this guy. And they don't have any loyalty to that person. So, you know, I was able to capture a good amount of, 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 of business that way. Probably, that was probably the most beneficial thing I did 
you know, at all in, in building a practice versus, you know, certainly the reconstructive side of my practice. I mean, that, that was it for sure. That's interesting. I mean, um, so you, you realized you don't want to be everything to everybody. You wanted to be something to somebody. You wanted to specialize. You wanted to be really good at something as opposed to, you know, running around and doing everything. That was something that was important to you. Right. Um, and then you realized, okay, for me to go there, I'm going to make sacrifices. One, my business is going to go down a little bit because I won't be as busy because I'm being very picky or more, more picky. And, uh, but also I have to plant my roots. Why should they send me all their reconstructive or hand surgery patients versus somebody else? So you said, oh, let me go meet them. And the fact that you met them is all it took for some of the people to say, you know what, um, uh, you know, I'm going, I'm going to go with, uh, you know, um, this person versus the other. Any other tips uh, that, that you did right that you want to share with our audience uh, in terms of building yeah. your kind of business within a business, your niche within a larger practice? I mean, that, I mean, that was my sort of, that was my initial strategy. So, in that, you know, for a while there, that, that kind of, you know, that, that was kind of what my focus was, was kind of just individually marketing myself as an individual, you know, and I think that works depending on your personality. Like for me, it worked because, you know, I feel like I'm a pretty... Yeah, you, you're guy. not threatening. You're very easygoing. Oh, yeah. They like you right off the bat, right. you know. And I had, and again, like I said, I had, I had a lot of good experiences and met a lot of people that were nice and, and enjoyed the time doing that. Um, you know, and I spent a little time at the hospitals and, you know, in the days past, you know, the hospitals were places where people congregated from the community. And that is really less so nowadays. I mean, the hospitals, they they have hospital employed, hospitalists and other physicians and the networks are smaller and the community doctors don't go to the hospital anymore. So it was not really a way, I really think that effective of a way, at least in this area, for me to get my name out there. You know, I mean, it worked to some degree in a very small, you know, environments, but, but for the most part, I found it to be less, less useful than, than, than hitting the pavement, honestly. And so that's what I, that's what I did for a while. Um, and, you know, and I, and I made friends and this and that, and that, you know, and that helped. And, you know, you really only need a few people to send you a lot of patients. You know, if you, if you can get a few people that send you lots of patients, that's really all you need. And then the rest, you know, then word of mouth takes over. Um, you have two other parts to your practice, right? I mean, one is hand surgery. The other, <laughs> you try to focus on that and also uh, the aesthetic side. So talk about how did you build those practices? Uh, I mean, the hand surgery part was, was again, a lot of this, you know, direct, you know, word to, word to mouth, word of mouth and direct person to person marketing. But then, And mostly like uh, GPs, you went after family doctors. Yeah, mostly. I mean, it's sort of, a, I looked at all the ancillary, it's like, like who needs a hand surgeon, you know, the neurologists for people with, you know, carpal tunnel and other kind of peripheral nerve issues. I mean, there were a lot of general orthopedic surgeons that, that would see patients with hand problems that didn't necessarily want to deal with them or, didn't want to deal with the complex ones. So I was, uh, I met a lot of general orthopedic surgeons, pain management, you know, physiatrists, like any, any kind of ancillary specialty that might even ever need a hand surgeon. I, I kind of went out and, and tried to spread the word, you know, with them. And you met with them, had lunch with them, talked to them 15 minutes and they remembered you. Oh yeah, I, I know Dr. Brian. So I'm going to send him there. And therapists, therapists are another huge, huge um, source of both you know, I need therapists to help my patients, number one. So I've, to building a personal relationship with your therapist is huge. But I get a lot of secondary referrals from the therapist. You know, I see a lot of people that have, oh, so-and-so were operated by somebody, somebody else, or they were just sent by their primary care doctor to see feet therapy, but they really need a surgeon. You know, can you see them? You know, so I get a lot of business like that as well. Um, so, you know, there's, so I, I think you just have to sit and think about, you know, the, the 360 degrees of your of the type of practice you do and like where where could anybody patient ever potentially come from you know and you really got you hit every angle as much as you can um and i and i found that to be very effective for the reconstructive side but you know the aesthetic side is a bit different. so before we get into aesthetics i do have a couple of follow-up questions sure. you talked sure. about that lunch right that meeting the 15 minute meeting what do you do to maintain that relationship or make them continue to send patients make them continue to you know, like you or right. trust you? That's a good question. I mean, I, I, every time I see a patient as a consultation, I send the doctor a, a letter, an individual letter about the patient and a copy of my consultation for every patient that, that gets referred with a, from a specific physician, whether I know them or not. 
Um, you know, I take the, the five minutes or three minutes it takes to dictate a letter and, uh, and then my assistant send a copy of that to them. And I, I think that the debt direct, and I mean, if, it, if, it's, I, if I know them personal enough, I will call them directly. You know, if I know them well enough or I know their number, I'll, I will often, you know, call someone directly if it's certainly if it's something difficult or complicated. If it's just like a straightforward thing, I'll just send a letter saying, hey, thank you so much. I saw the patient. This is what we're going to do. I really appreciate you sending them over. Here's a copy of my console for your records. You know, please call me anytime. And I, and I, and I think that goes a long way because I think a lot of people don't do that. And mm -hmm. I got that. I actually got that advice from one of my partners. Who uh, she, that was her. That was something that she did that she thought was very helpful. And I and I adopted that. And you then the other, yeah. You remind me of a story. There was a dermatologist who got the most number of reviews from other doctors. There's a platform that I'm affiliated with called Doctors Choice Awards. It's free where doctors rate doctors. And I asked him, "What is your secret? How did you get the most number of reviews from doctors?" He said. I send a letter to every doctor who refers to me after every patient. That's it. I, I'm just nice to them. I treat them like human beings. I treat them like, you know, I appreciate them. This, it sounds so simple and stupid, but it's, but 90% of people, a lot of people don't do it. So it, right. it makes a difference when you do it. And I, yeah, so I found that to be very important also. Um, so, fo you know, follow up and follow through. You know, if you have somebody with a lab value, you know, if there's someone you're worried about, you know, you got to reach out, call the doc, call the primary care doc and say, hey, you know, this guy, I was about to do surgery for him, but his blood sugar was 500. You know, he really needs to stay taken care of. You know, it's a, you know, I think they appreciate you, you know, taking a step beyond and which and most of the time it requires very little effort or thought, you know, almost none, you know, to do. Yeah, it makes sense. Now, let's jump into the aesthetic side. So how did you grow your aesthetic practice? You know, I mean, I mean, I'll be honest, it's a work in progress. Like, I think everybody probably feels that way to a degree. Um, you know, we, as being part of a larger entity, you know, we do the practice as a whole. We have our own in-house marketing, who, you know, who is, who are excellent. And, you know, so I, I mean, I definitely use them as a resource. But, you know, you realize that it's, you know, it's a small department. There's four women and, you know, and, and, all, and as excellent as they are, because they are, you know, they don't have enough manpower to really promote each person individually. It's just not possible, you know, so, and I, and so in the beginning when I wasn't really thinking about it so much, I just, you know, figured I would take what I could get. Uh, but then, you know, about a year and a half ago or so, you know, I kind of thinking that I, you know, I wanted to focus a little more on my aesthetic practice and to try to build that up and, you know, how do I individualize it? And so I, you know, decided to, had my own website made and decided to invest some of my own money into marketing myself, you know, beyond what the group is doing in terms of mostly in terms of, you know, online, you know, Google search and Google marketing, things like that. Um, and, and, and started to participate more in social media and, and, and stuff like that. And I think that has substantially paid dividends, um, you know, cause you know, part of it, part of me was like, well, who, you know, who would just go on Google and Google search a plastic surgeon and then actually go see them without getting a personal referral? But believe it or not, people do. You know, that is a thing, you know, and, and a lot of people do, surprisingly enough, you know, and um, I was a little skeptical at first and I was, you know, kind of just dipped my toe in the waters and uh, and it really paid back. And I so I have subsequently sort of invested more in it. Um, you know, one of the things about a surgical practice versus, say, dermatology or something like that, or, or an ejectable practice, you know, where it's a high, it's a high dollar value procedure. So, you know, although you may invest a certain X, X amount of money per month in marketing, you know, one, one, if that converts one patient, one, you know, if I get one patient out of it, you know, it, it can cover everything, you know, it can cover my whole investment, just one case, you know, per month. And if that's, you know, and that, which is a pretty low bar, really. Yeah, you know, things like that. So, you know, so you don't really need that much return to, to, to come out ahead, you know. So, and, and so for me, I figured it's worth it no matter what happens, you know, because of, and eventually I realized, you know, I figured there's probably a period of time where it's, you're basically just covering the cost, you know, you're, you get a few patients here and there, but eventually like anything else, you know, it feeds itself and word of mouth gets out there and, you know, it all kind of comes together eventually. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, doctors do that kind of kind of works against them is they overthink. And I like the way you think. You know, you look at the worst case. What is the worst case for me to call this a win? And the worst case, you have to get at least one patient. So at least you're not losing money, right? right? So that way, you don't have to overthink this. So as long as you're comfortable with, yeah, I think I can get one patient, try it, see what happens, you know? Right, exactly. So, as, long, as long as I'm not losing money. It, yeah, I mean, now deal. everything else is gravy on top of it, right? Now, let's say you get 20 patients. Hey, that's 19 people you wouldn't, you wouldn't have otherwise gotten that is right. coming for you because you are willing to take that chance and do that thing, you know? And it's, and it's harder, in, you know, and depending on where you practice, I mean, this particular area is, uh, I mean, is a very competitive environment. You know, there's, you know, you could, there's a plastic surgeon on every corner, you know what I mean? And so there's a lot of people and they're all, and it's not like they're bad. And I'm, you know, there are many of them are excellent. You know, there's, it's, it's, you know, it's one thing if you, you can't walk around and say, oh, they're all slouches. Cause that's not true. You know, they're, I mean, I've got 22 other partners who are all good surgeons. So, you know, that's the other thing about being part of a group is, you know, inherently you're, somewhat competing against each other in a way yeah and yeah. Uh, i agree and i think to your point that it works you're 100 percent right like i mean i'll share some data because i won't mention the name but he, this is the plastic surgeon who we work with in beverly hills uh, he started with us 12 years ago so right out of college so we have been you know it's overnight success 12 years in the making so i'm not going to pretend this happened in two minutes it took 12 years to get here today he's seen 600,000 times on google alone for uh, 14,000 keywords, out of which 3,000 keywords on page one, meaning he's number one, number two, number three, number four. Again, I'm not talking one or two keywords, 3,000 keywords. And he's getting 750 phone calls in one month, and he's getting 300 forms in one month. I mean, the numbers are astronomical. Of course, it didn't happen like in one year or six months. It happened in 12 years. But that's the beauty of anything you talked about today. You know, you... you went and had lunch with people you took your time you didn't make a cent from that lunch you probably lost money from that lunch because it took 30 minutes of your time or one hour of your time and you know you bought the lunch so that's a couple of you know whatever the amount of money you spent on it but that one lunch may have sent you gotten you 20 patients <laughs> so you know it, it's 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 a it's a mindset i think that's so powerful like same thing with digital marketing you know of course you need to have the right team working on your marketing every single week, every single month. But if you do it, I mean, the example I just shared with you, you know, um, 300 appointment forms and uh, 700 calls a month is, is happening after 12 years. But you need to be that long-term thinker. You know, if you're not that long-term thinker, it's hard to build any business. If right. you're like, I want to wake up and tomorrow everything should be great, it's not going to happen. You have to, you have to invest and create it, build it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, so I, and I and I look. That's the way I am choosing to look at it because I figure I'm I'm doing okay. You know, I'm not I'm not I'm not struggling in terms of, of financially at the moment, and so I'm I'm okay with with building a long term prospect versus trying for a short term you know return of investment. You know, um, yeah. So that's that was my 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 mindset on it, and I just you know mostly just want to enjoy what I'm doing, and and you know put out a good product, have happy patients, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so I think that's, you know, I think it's important, I think it's important to have that sort of ad general attitude. Yeah. In other words, you have a vision of what makes you happy, like the kind of work you do, uh, you want to get better at it. And the way right. you get better at it is by specializing, but also you have a vision of what, what a better tomorrow can look like. And you are trying to think, okay, what can I do today? that's going to help me create that better tomorrow in terms of the type of patients you want to see right. in terms of the type of work you want to do in terms of the financial rewards you want to have and you just keep at it so this year is better than three years ago and hopefully three years from now will be better than this year right because you're just right. just plugging away you know doing right. the things that are critical exactly. i love that mindset let's talk you know, we talked about marketing a lot we talked about you know, building relationships, other referring physicians, and how do you keep in touch with them? How do you make them feel valued and appreciated every time they send a patient? Um, now let's switch gears. Let's talk about people, right? People are a big part of it. And again, there are two types of people, the patients, and then of course, the teams, people, team members you work with. What's your wisdom or your thoughts on, you know, how do you work with people in who, who are in your office? Who are? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, first, you know, in terms of my 
I just try to literally be nice to people. I mean, it's really not, I don't really have a strategy per se. I mean, I just sort of treat people the way I would want to be treated. I mean, I mean, I certainly have a, have a, a style with which I interact with my patients and, and which was like, you know, would treat a consultation or, or a new patient or any, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm sort of made a decision that I'm not a salesman. I'm just honest. Like I'm going to give somebody an honest opinion about what, you know, what they're coming in for you know, what, what can happen to them and, you know, what's the best, you know, what, what to expect from the, from the relationship between me and them and this, and this kind of a thing. And like, I don't sugarcoat anything. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's all, you know, respect, honesty, personalized, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I don't blow smoke up anybody's anything ever, you know, that, because, you know, and I'd rather say no or have them choose somebody else if they're looking for, something like that you know yeah let's talk about that you, you shared a huge huge uh, valuable lesson here that many people don't understand that is a um, lot of people are worried about will the patient accept my treatment that fear makes a lot of doctors not share what they really wanted to share because they're afraid oh you know they look they look at the person and he's driving a beat up car i'm just making this up oh he's having a tone jacket they're like oh this guy can't afford it so let me let me not even try but I find the people who are successful, they treat it like, what would I want someone to tell me if I'm on the other side? And what I would want somebody to tell me is the truth, you know, what right. they see, you know, that's why they, they picked up the, you know, they came here and they're meeting with you, right? So I think if you take that mindset, even if they don't accept it, you don't take it personally. It's nothing about you. It's right. something happening in their life, maybe financial or otherwise. Or, and sometimes you might be surprised that person with the tone bag might write a check for $20,000. So you can't right. judge people yeah. just based on you know experiences. You just have to always be honest and just right. tell them what you would like your doctor to tell you, which is the truth, right? The honesty. Right. I think, I think, that, I think people appreciate it or you know, that's, at least the, you know, I find, I think you attract a certain type of patient, you know what I mean? I think that, I think eventually people of a certain like-mindedness or per, will, will find you, you know what I mean? And I feel like I get a certain type of patient that, that is different than maybe some of the, my patients, my partners see, they have a different personality. They come from different, a different area, you know, a different part of the island and they have different, you know, just a different character you know and that's fine and I'm, I'm happy with the you know the attracting the types of patients that that, that come to see me you know I, i'm very much happy with it and, and and don't and i'm not complaining but i think like you said you project confidence and honesty i think are the two things that i would say are the um because it puts people at ease they feel comfortable they feel like they trust you because you're you're you know if you're confident you're you're not having it on you're giving them a, a straightforward honest opinion and explaining things in a way that people understand and um you know and i think that's important yeah so like like just like a friend is explaining something a friend who knows the the domain you know in right. simple terms not um, and i think you're right doesn't mean that this is the only way to do it i mean if you are one of those celebrity doctors and yeah, all the people who come to you are like celebrities and stuff and that might be good for them because that's who they are and that's what their project doesn't mean that what they have to do what you do and doesn't mean that you have to do what they do so i, I like your point about this is not every. This is not how every single person that you ever meet practice. But for you, this works. Right, and it takes took you know. I mean, it took time to figure that out. You know, it wasn't like right. it was an overnight process. And I was probably not very good at it. Right. And, you know, seven eight years ago, and I have sub subsequently gotten better, and you know, converting more patients. You know, into you know, consultations to actual patients. I think just over time and experience, and just saying you know. Just saying it is. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and not really worrying about each individual. I'm like, oh my God, did they, did they, did they book the surgery? Did they schedule this? They're, they're not. It's just like, well, you know, I did what I could, and I hope that they. And I say, I hope you come back. Right. And I, you know, and I, and I also one other thing I do is I send every cons a cosmetic consultation a uh, an email, personal email, saying thank you for coming. I'm, this is what we discussed. I think you're a great candidate for surgery. You know, please reach out if you have any questions. You know, I would say 80% of people don't even reply, but, you know, 20% do. Some have other questions. Some say, thank you very much. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. You know, so it takes, you know, another thing, it takes two minutes of time that I think people probably on some level appreciate. Absolutely. One tip you might find interesting is uh, today people don't read all their emails, but they do read all their texts. 
Have you experimented with text as a form of communication? I, I haven't done too much with that. Um, okay. No, I haven't, honestly. Um, but I just haven't like logistically figured out how to do that. Yeah, there are tools. Yeah. I'll give you some tips or ideas later on. But yeah, you have to think through how to do it in a scalable fashion. <laughs> you know, because I'm honestly like, you know, I want to maintain a level of privacy. I don't want my phone number. Yeah, yeah. You don't or, want your cell phone be the one right. that you're texting exactly. from. Exactly. <laughs> So logistically, I haven't quite figured that one out yet, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, definitely a thought, you know. Yeah, um, I, I love everything you shared. I, it, it, you come across, I mean, this is going to be my final question. You come across like a reflective person, a thoughtful person. Do you have any practices, either on a daily basis, annual basis, where you kind of sit back and think? To kind of yeah. Because you said you didn't have all these answers on day one. These were something that you figured out over the long time. So, so I'm just trying to understand how is that, how do you figure out the answers? Uh, How do you yeah. kind of? I would say for me, it was, it's, uh, you know, it comes in fits and spurts and, you know, some, and I think I, I drive a lot, you know, for work. So I have a lot of time in the car. I think a lot when I drive, you know, I think having some personal time is important, whether, you know, wherever that is, you know, for me, it's a lot of it's in the car because I don't get, you know, have a lot of distractions, you know, at home for me is, is, you know, kind of crazy. You get some you know, young you know, children and things like that. So it's a little bit, that's not as relaxing of a place. Um, but, um, you know, so I find that I do think a lot when I drive and then, you know, just it's trial and error, like anything else. I think you try something, you see how it works, you see, you know, how can I do that better? And, you know, what, maybe what other things have I not done? Or, you know, uh, you know, the tip about emailing somebody, I, I, I picked that up because, or communicating with the patient afterwards is, you know, I, I, when I was last quick story, I was, I was just in practice and, and a friend of the family had wanted to have some cosmetic procedure done, but they wanted to go into the city. They didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to come see me. I was fresh in practice. They weren't interested in that. I said, fine. And I gave them two names of people I knew from training to go see these two people. They're both great. And they ended up going and then they came back and they said, I like them both. But, you know, one, one of them sent me a nice note afterwards and I, I'm going to go with them. And I was like, I was like, ah, oh, really? I'm like, I'm like, can't believe that that actually made a difference. But I'm like, you know what? If it works for him. It's probably gonna work. It could work for me too. And so I just kept, I just got in the habit of doing it, and I still do. Yeah, I think all of these demonstrate that you care, right? Whether it's the letter to the doctor or whether it's that personal visit to the doctor or even the letter to the patient, it just shows that you care. I think we, as we get more and more isolated with devices, that when somebody says I care, I think it stands out. I totally agree with you. These personal touches, these extra miles, that's kind of not the norm, stands out in people's mind. Um, you know, so I think you're onto something. So thank you, thank you for all of these tips. I think we learned a lot. Uh, if somebody wants to follow you or get to know you more, any, any, any places they can go to or any way to get a hold of you. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I have, uh, my Instagram is uh, Brian Pinsky MD is, uh, is my Instagram handle and uh, at Brian Pinsky MD. And then I have www.brianpinskymd.com is my uh, website. And so I can be easily reached under any of those places. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinsky. Uh, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, I enjoyed it. So I'm sure yeah, our you. listeners are going to enjoy it. That's and, good. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you love the podcast, share with you, share it with your friends. You yeah, know, uh, we'll create videos, and uh, you know, so feel free to share it. And uh, please feel free to subscribe to the podcast, everyone. And uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next Business of Aesthetics podcast show. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us this week on the Business of Aesthetics podcast series, brought to you by our gold sponsor, Aesthetic Management Partners. AMP innovates your aesthetic practice and silver sponsors Eilis Works and Pronox. Would you like to join our growing group of aesthetic industry experts and get featured on the Business of Aesthetics podcast? Or do you know someone who would love to share their strategies for growth in the aesthetic business, providing quality patient care or their clinical expertise? Head on over to businessofaesthetics.org forward slash speakers and apply to be featured as a guest on the show. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen. If you would like to engage with today's or any of our past speakers, join our Facebook group or LinkedIn group by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Thank you and have a great day.